Okay, uh, today I'm going to be talking about how to build high performance organizations. And at the end of this talk, what I hope is you'll see how to build incredible loyalty uh, within your organization. But before I start my talk, let's, I want to provide a context for this talk. When I was a very young manager, 20-something, uh, my boss came to me and said, Ron, we have a failing project, and we would like you to take it over and turn it around. And it wasn't a particularly large project, but he said, do you think you can do that? And having much more confidence than I had any right to have, I said, yes. And I got there, and I found that the manager before me had about 20 years' experience on me and he had done everything right from a managerial perspective. Good plans, good work breakdown, good tracking, good accountability, and yet the project was still failing. My first thought was, how do I get off this project? <laughs> my second thought was, I've made my bed, I have to lie in it. My third thought is, I don't have a frigging clue of what to do. I was smart enough to realize that I wasn't going to outmanage uh, this project to success. I had to do something differently. I had to keep all the management principles, but I had to add something. And, and the project went on to be a success. But once again, it was only a small project. And they rewarded me, and you can guess how they rewarded me. They gave me bigger, dirtier projects to turn around. And at the end, I was doing projects 10 to 500 million dollars that had absolutely tanked and I was taking them from worst in class to best in class. And, and these were projects that involved 100 plus people, spanned two to three years. And about 20 years ago, I said to myself, well, that's really an organization. You're working with a team of 100 people over a period of two to three years. The gains that I'm getting through my approach, I should be able to achieve those same gains through an, uh, uh, for an organization. And so I started focusing on divisions and organizations, and I got very similar results. So my point is that what I'm going to share with you today is not based on theory. It's based on a lifetime of doing. There's a performance curve, a typical performance curve, uh, a bell curve with a tail. And what we have is we have high performance down here, and uh, this is all the organizations in the world. And uh, within one standard deviation of the mean, you have approximately 70% of the world's organization. And that represents normal performance. Now, way out on the right side, you have extremely high performing organizations. The difference between normal performance and high performance is not 10 or 20 or 30 percent. It's not 100 percent. The difference between normal and high performance is 300 percent. That's like tripling your workforce without adding a penny of cost. Another thing that is interesting here is the people that reside, the staff that live in organizations that make up high performance or organizations are no different in terms of skills and ability than those who make up low performance organizations. The difference is primarily, but not entirely, leadership. Es essentially what we call normal performance, it's only normal because we're used to seeing it. Normal performance, most organizations are grossly suboptimal. As managers, we have become masters of turning abundance into scarcity. Now, there's a couple of characteristics of the staff that live in high performance organizations. One, they have joy of work. That is something every single person started life with. When they enter an organization, they're eager, they're excited, they're looking forward to Monday morning. And in short order, that is somehow taken away from them. They start living for the weekends. Monday mornings become a drag. Another characteristic of high-performance organizations, and it's an incredible characteristic, 
the people that work in high performance organizations care more about the su success of the whole than they care about individual success. And there's a tragedy here. There's a couple of tragedies. We are essentially, by, by the way we manage and lead, we are leaving, we're allowing a phenomenal amount of performance to fall off the table. The second tragedy, by, by living here, we essentially are taking joy of work away from people. And the third tragedy is how you go from normal performance to high performance is not complex. It's almost trivial. Organizations have been around forever, but they came on mass at the start of the Industrial Revolution. And at that time, the most important asset in, in an organization was the machine. And good managers surrounded their machines with process in order to maximize the return in, of, of investment. And the people existed around that. People existed to work the process to serve the machine. And outside of all that, the only people with big picture understanding of the organization, where it was going, what the forces and trends were, what the competition was doing, was management. So in a sense, it was management's will that drove the people to work the process to serve the machine. That's Industry 1.0. Industry 2.0, which is the introduction of electricity, didn't change this one bit. About 50 years ago, we went to Industry 3.0 the information-based economy. And the most important asset was not computers. Anybody with money, any company with money could buy computers. It was the ability to use the computers, the ability to build the systems, to put in place the processes that allows you to store the data, turn data into information, and apply the data, apply that information to decision-making at the right point in time. The most important asset with economy 3.0, with industry 3.0, became process. And outside of that, nothing much changed. People existed to work the process, to serve the process, and management, and, and management was outside of all of that. It was, it was still management's will that was driving the people. About 15 years ago, it started to change. Companies have said forever, people are our most important asset, but when you looked at what they actually did, that was not the case. But it changed, started to change about 15 years ago. It started to change because of the speed of change. You hire a new member of staff, fresh out of university, fresh out of school, and you give her or him a, an assignment, an area that they're responsible for. Within six months, they know more than you about that particular area. That was how fast things were moving. And managers were forced to delegate for the first time en masse. And, and, and so people moved to the center, and just like they did with machines, they started surrounding people with process in order to maximize the return on, on investment. And this process, if, if you delegate and you don't put, you'll have chaos if you don't put a good strategic plan in place, a good business plan, clear objectives, clear values to drive decision making. And that's what companies started to put in place. Before that, Right across the West, planning was pretend planning. They did, pl they did planning, but they didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. That started to change significantly. But there's something that is remarkably different about this diagram. Managers aren't using their will to push the people. Managers are creating an environment now that allows people to use their own will to achieve the company's objectives. And this is no longer management. This is leadership. This is Moore's Law. Gordon Moore, late 60s, an engineer in an unknown company called Intel, postulated that every 18 months, the number of transistors on a square inch of integrated circuit board would double. And he made a wild ass prediction. He said that this doubling would go on for 10 years. My financial clients said, Ron, if you know something that's going to grow exponentially, invest in it in day one, and you'll own the universe on day 10, on, on year 10. Moore was wrong. And I'm showing this on a logarithmic scale, and that's why it's linear. On a logarithmic scale, exponential growth comes out as a line. If I didn't use a logarithmic scale, this would go to the moon. 
And he was wrong because this, this hasn't gone on for 10 years. It's gone on for 50 years and it's still going. The difference is, in the beginning, we were going from two to four to eight transistors on a square inch integrated circuit board. We're now going from two billion to four billion to eight billion transistors on a square inch of integrated circuit board. This is the biggest impact in your lifetime in your workplace. This techie, nerdy law has affected you more than anything else. That smartphone that you have in your pocket, 20 years ago, you paid $600 for it today. 20 years ago, it would have cost you $600,000. 40 years ago, it would have cost you $600,000. OK, computing has gotten cheaper. Big deal. Why is this law, this phenomenon, so important to you? This is why. In the, in the 30s, the doubling rate of knowledge, the knowledge that you would have to pay attention to because your competition could learn something and put you out of business, was doubling every 35 years. In the 70s, that doubling rate of knowledge had dropped to seven years. Based on the work of Nick Bondi out of McMaster University, that doubling rate of knowledge is now less than half a day. You take a day off, and you come back, your world has quadrupled. This is Industry 4.0. This defines Industry 4.0. Non-stop innovation, non-stop creation is required to survive. Knowledge, knowledge today has the shelf life of a banana, probably less than that. And what this means is you hire people because they know stuff. What they know is, in a couple of weeks, isn't worth anything. A couple of weeks is not worth anything. So what is worth something? What is worth something is the ability of people to come together on a constant basis and create new knowledge. And this depends on the quality of the interaction. How people interact dictates the quality of their ability to create and to create continuously. How people interact that's the culture of the organization. People have been at the center, well, machines were at the center of the organizational universe for about 200 years. Process was at the center of the organizational universe for about 50 years. Your people have been at the center of your universe for about 15 years. And you know what? Your people are no longer your most important asset. Your most important asset is culture. The ability of your people to come together and create nonstop. And that's why we are seeing a transition not from managing to managing and leading. But it's not any form of leadership. Leadership 1.0, which is industrial age leadership, which probably represents 95% of the world's managers, are still in industry 1.0. Industrial, an industrial age approach to management. The focus is making the individual productive. That is the focus of Leadership 1.0. And you know you work in an organization where the leaders are practicing industrial age management if you hear this phrase, we all have a job, and if we do our jobs, we will succeed. That's seeing the, <coughs> the, the individual as the be-all and end-all. In industrial age management, whoops, the whole is equal to the sum of, of its parts on a good day with a lot of sweat. And that's obvious because the whole is the collection of individuals. For leadership 4.0, knowledge age leaders recognize not only do you manage the individuals, you manage the space between the individuals. You manage the magic. Your job is to pull out that magic that happens between in individuals. Because you know what a 300% gain means? A 300% improvement to, to move to a high performance productivity organization? It means that between any two individuals, there are another four individuals hiding that are essential to the creation of new services, new products, new solutions. 
liter, 4.0 liters, you still are worried about building high-performance individuals, but you're worried about something else. You're worried about building high-performance relationships. And 4.0 leadership, 4.0 leaders know that the whole can be substantially more than the sum of its parts. The ability of, of your organization to, to survive in 4.0 in the knowledge age economy will depend directly on having leaders that can pull out that magic between your people. One plus one equals six. And when I did turnarounds, that's what I achieved. I made one plus one equals six, and I'm going to share with you now how I did it. I work with three intelligence. I, I go in and I do a turnaround. Only rarely would it be a management issue. One time in five, I'd have to tweak the management approach. It was always a cultural issue, almost always. And I worked with these three intelligences, and all I did was grow these three intelligences in order to make one plus one equals six. I know what you're all thinking right now. Whatever that guy is on, it's good stuff. <laughs> Emotional intelligence. Key to a 1.0 envi 4.0 environment is delegation. And I speak with managers, they say, Ron, I delegate, I delegate, but my people don't pick up the responsibility. Well, you know, giving people the freedom to act is not delegation. It's only the first tiny step in delegation. What you have to do is give your people the courage to act. And for that, they have to have self-esteem. They have to believe in themselves. They have to recognize their strengths. And the, 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 the degree to which people believe in themselves is a measure of the organization's objective. And by the way, I see people taking pictures. This presentation is freely available. I'll make it available to uh, um, great people inside, and, and, and you, you, you can request it. What you get is can-do people. I'll give you an example, two knowledge workers. One knowledge worker says, okay, I'm 10% into the project, and I spent 70% of my budget. Oh, I don't have to report till next quarter. That's uh, six and a half weeks away. Uh, I don't have to say anything. Second knowledge worker, I'm, I've done 10% of the project, I've spent 70% of the budget. I'm in trouble. I'm smart, I'm good, I'm capable, I'm successful, but I'm not seeing something here. I need help. The second knowledge worker had high emotional intelligence. They believed in themselves, they knew their strengths, and they had the courage to raise their hand. Which of those two knowledge workers would allow you as a manager to sleep at night? We act not according to our potential, we act not according to our ability, but we act according to how we see ourselves. We all walk around with two buckets that we do our self-talk, we have a positive bucket that we don't fill. We're really poor at, feeling, at saying good things about ourselves to ourselves. We have a negative bucket, and most of us are experts at trash-talking ourselves. I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough, I don't have the experience, I'm going to fail. In fact, if our friends talk to us the way we talk to ourselves, there wouldn't be many friendships in this world. Trouble is, is when you have those negative thoughts, is when your people have those negative thoughts over and over and over and over again, 10,000, 100,000 times, they're saying something negative about themselves, that forms into a belief. And what happens is those beliefs accumulate in the subconscious and they form an image. And then people start to regulate themselves to that image. Change begins inside. You want high performance. Change begins inside your people. As a manager, you are responsible for reaching inside your people and changing that image of themselves. This is usually the spot in the talk where managers have to give up, uh, get up and change their underwear. <laughs> I don't have time to go into everything that I do to build emotional intelligence, but I'm going to share one thing. It's called Ron, Ron's Rule. If I go in and I'm doing a turnaround and the budget for the turnaround is $10 million, I say a half a percent, a half a percent has to be reserved for celebration. $50,000 has to be reserved for celebration. And usually the clients go white at that point in time. And they say, 
we can't allocate $50,000 to celebration. I say, not a problem. I can do it with a zero budget for celebration. But rather than $10 million, I'll need 20 or maybe even $30 million <laughs> to turn. So it's your choice. And when you celebrate, you never celebrate at the end. That's a waste of money. You celebrate every little success that you can along the way. Change, if everybody tells you change is complex, don't listen to them. Change is dirt simple. I didn't say it was easy, but it's dirt simple. You move towards, you become that which you hold uppermost in your mind. That's the drive, that's the single driving force, that's the primary driving force of change. As a manager, if you can hold a thought uppermost in your people's, mi your people's mind, they'll either go crazy because they see themselves here and they're meant to be there, or they'll use the tension to make the change. As a manager, you want to build EI, you have to hold success upper uppermost in your people's mind. You have a, picture yourself with a mirror, and every time anyone is the tiniest bit successful, you're running around and you're holding that mirror up so that they can see that success. I have four children, they're adult children now, and when they were young, I educated them in the principles of change. That may have been a mistake. Um, <laughs> this is my younger daughter, Jenna, and uh, she is a driver-driver personality. Uh, she has the philosophy to take no prisoners. Uh, and she came to me and she said, when she was 14, she said, Dad, uh, I, I, I want a dog. She didn't want any dog, she wanted a schnauzer. And uh, I explained, I said, Jenna, um, I travel a lot, we have four children, our house has enough chaos in it already, uh, we are over my dead body, will we get a dog? <laughs> and to my surprise, she said, okay, Dad. <laughs> I put it down to my great parenting. Um, and then when I came home at night, she would take my laptop, unbeknownst to me, and she would change the screensaver. And this went on for 12 months, every day. And she would put a picture of a schnauzer on the screensaver. <laughs> and every day, it was a different picture of, 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 of a schnauzer. And by the ninth month, I was looking forward to them. <laughs> and by the 12th month, I was saying, Jesus, they're cute. <laughs> on the 12th month, I woke up, and on my dresser was an envelope from my daughter. And the outside of the envelope says, you become what you think you are. <laughs> and I open the envelope, and it says, I think I'm a schnauzer owner. <laughs> this is my daughter with the newest member of our family. <laughs> a very happy girl. You move towards to become that which you hold uppermost in your mind. Your job to build emotional intelligence to build confident people, change-ready people, is to hold success uppermost, that they are successful uppermost in their mind. Building relationship intelligence. Relationship intelligence is all about trust. Uh, it's about being able to connect with others, caring about the success of others, believing in others, believing in your colleagues. You know the phrase, I'm a professional? I don't have to like you to be able to work with you. That's crap. That will deliver you mediocre performance with a lot of sweat. You'll never win if, you, if the people in your company have that attitude. That is relationship intelligence. And what you get is people pushing each other towards success. It can be annoying. This is what every single one of you want. As managers, you want your people coming together, solving problems, creating solutions, creating product, pr products breaking mar new markets, and that requires frank and open communication. Most of us have had the opportunity to work on a great team. A great team is you look into the boardroom, and it looks like World War III in there, is, is that people are arguing, they're ripping the, 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 the marker out of each other's hands, they're ripping apart each other's ideas, but they're having the time of their life. If you've ever experienced it with colleagues you can be t t totally open with, you can share your half-baked idea and feel confident they won't judge you for it. It's wonderful. But you have to have trust to get it. You have to have trust. And the way you get trust, trust is not complex. You have to have attachment. I have to know you as a human being. I have to take the time 
to know you. Industry 1.0 managers say this is inefficient, it's a waste of time. 4.0 managers realize this is how you get the magic out. It's, there's I, there's you, there's we, and the we is the relationship. And how do you grow relationships? Well, you're part of a system, and every now and then you have to come out of the system, and you have to stand back and, and both of you say, evaluate the system. How do you see me? How am I doing? Do you th how do you think the relationship is going? Is our relationship productive? For the female of our species, this comes naturally. For the male of our species, they're saying right now, really? <laughs> I have to do this? And the answer is yes, you do. Or you'll be staying at home worrying about your figure. This is essential. You have to master this skill if you want to be a 4.0 manager. And this applies to a relationship is, is, is something that is always deteriorating. And it is something that always requires a touch for it to be healthy. So how do you grow relationships? You think, you, think, you think relationships, you move towards you become that which you hold uppermost in your mind, and you work at building attachment. And all the things this gentleman said are bang on. I hold town hall meetings. Meetings of the entire team. If I have a team of 100, I'll hold it every six weeks, minimum. Not six weeks, I'll come back. That six weeks is critical. Drives the executive and the company crazy. Because it's a half day, and they come to me, half day, you just lost 50 person days, Ron. Fortunately, they are in such bad shape that they have to give me enough rope. Breakfasts, social events, games in the project rooms. I was once doing a turnaround at a bank. I don't know if you know banks, but they're very conservative. When they go to the bathroom, it comes out in little cubes. And what I did, I had a team of over 100 people doing a turnaround. So one of the things I did is I went and bought a foosball game, a very good one. You know, the foosball games, you haven't seen them in bars, they, they're soccer, on, soccer men on, on a metal rod and you turn them and you hit a little ball back and forth. And I put it into the boardroom. And so 100 people plus, they didn't know each other, but they would come together and they would play a game, two or four of them, they would laugh for 50 minutes, it was a good metal break. But they started to get to know each other a little more. It's non-stop doing stuff like that. CI, corporate intelligence. Corporate intelligence is about a shared vision and shared values. If you think people are working with you, for you, for pay, then you have already failed. It's connecting people to the meaning of work. When your workers <coughs> get life meaning from their work, they end up owning the organization. And they believe in the organization. High performance organizations, you know what the people are in them? They're zealots. They would take a bullet for the organization. That's corporate intelligence. This is an iceberg. And this represents the people, what people think. People implicitly, without talking to each other, have their own understanding of their organization. What's working, what the priorities are, what the trends and forces that are relevant to the organization, what the opportunities and what the issues are. And their actions are explicit. And I speak with, 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 with leaders around the world and I tell them, you have the most educated workforce in the history of the human race. Your people want to make a difference. It is the common characteristic of humanity that almost all of us want to look back at our career and say, my organization, my society, the world maybe, is a little better as a result of what I contributed. That's what most of us want. And your people are working to the point of burnout. And the, and the CEOs look at disbelief and say, well, I have such a wonderful environment. Why does this year feel a whole lot like last year? Why does progress feel like watching molasses flow uphill? And the reason is this, you have great people, but they all have their own definition of doing good. 
They're all on their own bus going in different directions. And so a lot of effort is spent for little gain. In high CI org organizations, there's a clear and common desired future. People are aligned and they can build off of each other. They can learn from each other. Charles Handy uh, was one of the founders of the London uh, business program in the London School of Economics. He is, I refer to him as an Irish business philosopher. He's one of my favorite authors. And this is a quote from him. It's the leader's responsibility to provide purpose. If you want to retain good people, if you want to retain talent, you've got to create cause. Otherwise, you get a relationship in which I'm working for you purely because I'm earning money. Then you get very short-term thinking, very selfish thinking. This is the definition of corporate intelligence. Corporate intelligence is about being able to deep deeply connect the people of the organization with a common future. So they're able to release and align their energies in its achievement. Characteristic Characteristics of a, high, of, a high, of a high CI organization, you see up there. Interesting one is people without resumes. If, 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 if your people have their resumes up to date, you're, you're in trouble. Thank you, David. Um, there are two characteristics up here that are absolutely critical to a high performance organization. The first is people caring about the success of, 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 of the whole. I did this presentation in Hungary and, and, and when I mentioned you have to care about the success of the whole, the room was silent. Then one very junior manager put up his hand and said, Ron, sounds like communism to me. <laughs> you care about the success of the whole because then people are making the right decisions. There was a company in the States that hired the absolute best from the Ivy League University, paid them a ridiculous amount of money, and deliberately put in what was called star culture. Star culture was you do what's good for you, and that will be good for the company. And that company was Enron. The second key characteristic is courage. And <clears throat> when I work with clients, they know their current reality is uncomfortable, will not, is not suitable for them to go to the next level of performance, and they can fairly easily identify a desired future. But they have to go through the hallway of change, otherwise known as the hallway of hell. And they enter it eagerly, but the first scary thing they see, they turn and run back to the old because it's what they know. We have been bred as a race to fear change. And that is never going away, at least in our lifetime. But if you have courage, if you have belief that what you're doing is essential, is important, then that gives you the courage to work through your fear and not be limited by it. Starts with the leaders. You can't pretend. You can't go and build cause in others unless you have cause in yourself. As a leader, there's something that makes you happy. You have a mission in life. There's society's needs, your society's needs, and somewhere they overlap, and that is your leadership mission. And you have to work on things that allow you to, as a leader, if you want to be a leader that can lead others, you first have to be inspired. Because leadership is a privilege. You have the privilege of taking the organization's mission and your life's mission and putting the two together to create the DNA of the organization, the life of the organization. Laser organizations are all about phase synchronization of photons. That's what makes lasers so powerful. So how, how do you create a laser organization with people? What, 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 what leads to a phase synchronization? It's communication, nonstop communication. Max Dupree said, as a leader, if you're not sick and tired of communicating, you're probably not doing a good enough job. A study of my, a colleague of mine did a study, is that when you communicate, what is the half-life of that communication? Before people forget half of it, it'd be wonderful if it remained a vacuum, but they fill it, fill it back in with what they think it should be. The half-life of a communication is six weeks. In six weeks, essentially, you've got to start all over, every six weeks. That's why I have the six-week rule, is when I'm communicating, at a minimum, I, commu I, I, have a, I take everyone out and, and we do a major communication every six weeks. And what do you communicate? The end point and the difference that its achievement will make to our organizations, our client, and our world. You have to show why the work is worthy of people's time. 
The soft stuff is now the hard stuff. Focusing on efficient task execution is no longer good enough. You still have to do that. But as a 4.0 leader, you have to engage the heart and the soul of the people that work for you. I'm, I'm a Star Trek fan. I always have been a Star Trek fan. And Star Trek has a prime directive. Well, there's a prime directive for 4.0 leaders, and that is create joy of work. If you create joy of work, almost everything else will follow. It will lead to this. You want joy of work? You want high performance? Build the self-esteem, build trust, and build commitment to the whole. I've just skimmed over it. Uh, my book is available, and it goes into more detail. My website, Ron, at ronweens.com, I have numerous white paper papers that are freely available. And it's been a pleasure talking with you today.